Hey guys, welcome back. In today's video, I want to cover the topic of performance, which is a crucial element of any game. Now before I start, I want to say that performance is an extremely game specific topic, so for that reason there is no one step solution, and what may work for someone else does not mean that it will work for you. So instead, for this video, I'm just going to show you how you can identify areas that are causing drops in performance, as well as list a series of techniques that can be used to improve performance. So, to start off, let's first get a basic understanding of the Central Processing Unit, or CPU, and the Graphics Processing Unit, GPU. The reason for this is because these two units work together to essentially make your game run. The CPU, every frame, updates the game state. This includes checking player input, calculating collisions, physics. Once these calculations are done, the CPU then decides what needs to be drawn on the screen, and sends these instructions to the GPU which handles generally graphical related elements, i.e. the actual visuals of the game. And with these instructions, the GPU draws the frame. Now, as you can probably figure out, if we have an issue with either the CPU or GPU, it will bottleneck the entire process regardless of the other unit. And this is why it is important to identify where your game is losing performance, because it is pointless applying techniques that aid the GPU when it's actually the CPU where the bottleneck is occurring. When the CPU is causing issues, we call this CPU bound, and if the GPU is causing issues, we call this GPU bound. So how do we know what is causing the loss in performance? Well, luckily Unity comes with a built-in system called the Profiler, that analyzes our game while it is running and provides useful data that can be used to identify where we need to apply certain tactics. To bring up the Profiler, navigate to Window Analysis Profiler. Looking at the interface, you will notice a column on the left with a series of rows. These are called profilers, and they each display information about a specific aspect in your game. However, for this video we will be focusing on the CPU usage profiler, since we can use this to determine if our issues are CPU or GPU bound. Note that there is also a GPU profiler, which can be added from the add profiler button, but depending on your graphics card, the profiler may not be supported and therefore we will not cover it in this video. Using the comparison between CPU and GPU times, we can determine which area is causing issues. The highest time indicates that that unit is the bottleneck for the specific frame. Alternatively, to see if our performance issues are GPU related, click on the CPU profiler and select the hierarchy overview. Then make sure that the data is filtered via time milliseconds. This will arrange all the calls in a list of how long they took to execute. Under player loop, look for the function gfx.waitforpresent. If this function is taking a long time, it indicates that the CPU is waiting for the GPU, and therefore our performance issues are GPU related. Since the CPU deals with a range of tasks, we can use the profiler graph to determine which aspects are most intensive. Now that we have identified the areas where we have bottlenecks for our game, let's look at some optimization techniques. Note that most techniques have a crossover effect in improving both CPU and GPU. The goal for CPU optimization is to essentially reduce the amount of work the CPU needs to do. This can be done by reducing the visible object count in the scene. This will also aid the GPU. But also we can improve our scripts. To start off, let's look at what we can do in our physical scene. Using a process called draw call batching, we can group game objects in our scene together that share the same material, which allows multiple game objects to be processed within the same draw call. The fewer draw calls we have, the better, since draw calls are often resource intensive, which causes performance overhead on the CPU. In Unity, setting up batching is actually extremely easy. All you have to do is select the game objects you want to batch, and under static options, select batching static. Note that the static batching requires the game object to be static, i.e. not moving. There is a method of batching for game objects that do not move called dynamic batching, but luckily this is handled automatically by Unity for game objects within a certain vertex count. Also note that static batching will occupy some memory and storage. Complementing batching nicely is the next technique which is to use fewer materials in your game objects by putting multiple textures into a large texture atlas, 
allowing more game objects to be processed within the same draw call. Creating texture atlases is something done outside of Unity in a 3D modeling software. However, generally across all 3D modeling software, you create multiple objects in the single project file and then select all of them and generate the UV map. Shadows, reflections and per pixel lights cause game objects to be rendered multiple times. So where possible, reduce the use of these elements. A max shadow distance can be set in the project settings, which can be brought up by navigating to edit, project settings. There are also other adjustable factors such as cascades, resolution, etc. However, I won't be covering them in this video. Remember, you can always hover over a setting in Unity to get a handy tooltip. Additionally, remember that not all models need shadows, such as small rocks. Per pixel lights calculate the lighting for every screen pixel, which allows for realistic lighting, however is more intensive compared to other lighting techniques, such as vertex lighting. A per pixel light count can be set in the project settings, which will cause Unity to render a certain amount of per pixel lighting, and if there is more lights than the set count, the other lights will automatically be rendered via the vertex method. Reflection probes have many parameters that can be used to aid performance, such as its resolution and area of effect. Moving away now from the physical scene, let's look at how we can optimize our scripts. As a rule of thumb, reduce the use of functions like update, fixed update, and late update. The reason for this is that these functions are constantly running, causing the CPU to continually execute what is within those functions. For example, let's say we have a game where the player is given a quest to find four items. We could have an update function that constantly checks if all four items are collected. However, we could achieve the same effect by calling a new function, one that checks if all the items are collected when we collect an item. Additionally, reduce the use of find-like functions, such as find game object of type or find game object with tag where possible. If there is no way to get around these functions, make sure you do them at the start of the game, such as in the awake method, rather than later on. Finally, avoid using the function instantiate, and instead opt for workarounds such as object pooling. I've linked a video by Brackies below about how you can set up object pooling. The first technique is to optimize your model geometry. Don't use any more triangles than necessary. If there is a side of your model that won't be seen in the game, such as the bottom of a crate, then delete the face. Also, remember you can create a high resolution model and bake it into a normal map, and then apply it to a lower poly version for improved performance. Baking light maps is the most efficient way to optimize lighting as it means that once the light map is generated, the lighting no longer needs to be computed in game. Baked lighting will also look better as you can bake global illumination. To bake the lighting for an object, select light map static from the static dropdown. Additionally, reduce the number of lights in your scene where possible. Many light effects such as subsurface scattering can be mimicked with shaders which will minimize performance loss whilst retaining detail. Compressing textures will improve load time. Compressed textures will also have a smaller memory footprint, which will aid in reducing garbage collection issues. When importing textures, they should automatically be enabled for compression, but also make sure that Generate Mipmaps is enabled if you're in a 3D scene. A mipmap allows the GPU to use a lower resolution texture for smaller triangles. Culling deactivates the rendering of game objects, which will in turn reduce draw calls. For small objects like pebbles, you can cull them more aggressively than larger objects, since the player wouldn't notice them at certain distances. To set a specific culling distance for a layer, use camera.layerCullDistance. Alternatively, you can use LOD groups since they contain a culled state. You can add a LOD group from the Add Component section of a game object. Talking about LOD groups, you can also add different resolutions of a model, 
so Unity can transition between them depending on its distance from the player. This will drastically improve performance, and if set up correctly, the player will not even notice the transition. Now, I almost forgot, but we need to have a look at occlusion culling. Unlike the previous culling techniques, occlusion culling culls what the camera cannot see. This is ideal for large scenes with lots of objects. To set up occlusion culling, select all the objects that you'd like to be capable of being culled and mark them as occluder static and occlude static. Next, navigate to Window, Rendering, Occlusion Culling, then select the Bake tab and adjust values if you want. But the default settings are pretty good, so to continue, press Bake. After the baking is complete, you can click Visualization to see how the occlusion culling is working. Finally, if you have a mesh that is repeated in your scene, such as a tree, building or grass, then make sure to enable GPU instancing on the material of that game object. This will allow multiple copies of the same mesh to be drawn at once, therefore reducing draw calls. So, that's all the techniques for now. Hopefully you have learned something new which will aid you in the optimization of your own game. This video briefly covered a range of techniques. So if you would like some additional detail on particular aspects, let me know in the comments. Alright, that's all for now, I'll see you in the next video.